Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see such a wonderful turnout. It says we have 68, 69, 70 now and it keeps going up and I also recognize that many of you have people in the room with you. So it's a great turnout and I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Catherine Brookman, the Associate Director for Knowledge Transfer and Exchange, and on behalf of Dr. Jack Callahan, Director of the Center of Research Expertise for the Prevention of Musculoskeletal Disorders, or CREAMSD as we are more commonly known, we'd like to thank you for joining us on this free webinar. We're grateful to the Ministry of Labor for our funding, which supports the delivery of these webinars, and to our presenters who provide their expertise. This webinar is part of the Client Patient Handling Community of Practice and we encourage you to let your colleagues know about the type of events that CREAMSD has. You can see these events by going on to our website and Bettina will type that link in for you. The format of the webinar is as follows. The presentations will be given, after which we will have hopefully 15 minutes for questions. There's a lot of you, so I know Emily, our presenter, will do her best to leave as much time for questions as possible. We will ask you to type your questions into the chat box, the same box that many of you have typed your greeting in. We will monitor these questions and we'll respond to them after, at the end of the presentation. Should you have some kind of technical difficulty, if you type that message in, we will try and troubleshoot that throughout the webinar. We may not be able to get to all of your questions today, but we will do our best. Please note that this presentation will be available on our website shortly after the presentation. Immediately following today's presentation you'll receive an evaluation and we encourage you to complete this evaluation. It will help us to bring you future webinars and to help us in providing a good experience for you. All right, I am thrilled to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Emily King. Emily is a MITTAX funded postdoctoral fellow at the University of Waterloo. Her goal is to improve safety and independence in home care. Emily's doctoral research focused on identifying tools and techniques for preventing injuries during assisted bathing and toileting. Her postdoctoral work is focused on quantifying the physical demands of home care work and on identifying and understanding the physical, social, and organizational factors that have the greatest influence on home care workers' risk of injury. Emily is also heavily involved in the design of assisted devices. She holds multiple patents and has contributed to the development of assisted technologies for toileting, mobility, and safe patient lifting. Emily holds a Bachelor of Science in Medical, Mechanical sorry, Engineering from the University of Waterloo, a Master's of Science in Biomedical Engineering, Biomechanical Engineering from the University of Toronto, and has recently completed her PhD in Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Toronto. So without further ado, I turn this webinar over to you, Emily. Thank you, Catherine. So Catherine's just given you a bit of an introduction to who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, Bettina, if I could ask you to show that poll, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the backgrounds that you're coming from. Um, I see from the registration information that we have a lot of OTs, PTs, uh, PSWs, home support workers, we have um, supervisors and coordinators on the line, and some ergonomists. So I'm just seeing a lot of you are from home care, uh, which is really where I've spent the majority of my focus. Uh, we also have a number from uh, long-term care, hospitals, and other sectors. I'm looking for the other sectors at the moment. 
adult day programs, community care. Residential services, developmental services, acute care. All of the above. Supportive housing, assisted living, ergonomics background. This is wonderful. We've got a wonderful diversity of attendees, and I'm I'm really delighted to see that there are so many people who are involved in in so many elements um, of providing care who are interested today. So, uh, as I said, my background's mostly focused on home care. Uh, I think there's good applicability in other areas as well, and I'll try to point that out as I go along. Uh, but please do forgive the home care slant. At least that will suit 58.4% of you. Um, I think our results have pretty well stabilized. I think most people have weighed in. So we'll just give you one or two more seconds, and then I'll ask. Okay, no, Bettina's just closed that. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much to everyone who participated that, in that. It's good to know where everyone's coming from. And, oh, I see a number of assisted living entries on the right as well, so that's one other area to mention. Uh, okay, so to move on with the presentation, because Catherine has promised you lots of time to answer questions, and I'll do my best to, to keep to that. Uh, so the focus today is talking about bathroom safety for home care providers. Um, as Catherine summarized, my background and interests uh, engineering background, mechanical and biomedical engineering. Um, I've looked at, uh, you know, falls. Why do they happen more as we get older and how can they be prevented was the focus of my master's work. And more recently, I've been looking at um, helping people to live well in their own homes for as long as possible, as independently as possible, without, and this is very important, without hurting their caregivers. Um, and I'm interested in doing this through research education and, and product design. So I think I've got some practical suggestions here for you today, but my disclaimer I feel obliged to offer is that I am not a clinician. I'm an engineer. Um, so take it as you will. Um, in this webinar, I'd like to quickly review how injuries happen, um, highlight key musculoskeletal disorder risks to look out for in client handling, and assess how to make some common bathroom activities safer, specifically bathing and toileting. So. At the crux of all this is that safe caregiving requires problem solving, especially in a home care environment. One size does not, cannot fit all. So we're not, I'm not just going to say, here is the best way to do X. I'm going to say, here are the challenges that you'll face, and here are the, some of the strategies that help, can help to reduce risk. And this is an area where I really do invite um, comment. We have people coming from a very um, diverse range of geographies and experiences today. So certainly if there are things where, you know, you think there are other twists in your environment that, um, that aren't addressed here or that may make it difficult to apply some of these suggestions, please, uh, I would love to discuss that at the end. I always like to you know, broaden my knowledge of what the challenges are, and I think that that can lead to quite a rich discussion. So if you see anything that's bugging you because you're not sure how it would fit or you're not sure if it can fit, um, Let's talk about that at the end. But first, a couple of types of injury, and I'd like to differentiate here. There are acute injuries. These are sudden events. These are the ones that we, we can identify most readily. So, for example, you know, a care recipient falls or collapses, and a caregiver is trying to support them as they go down, and what that ends up reading in the injury report is something like, his knees gave out. I tried to prevent a fall, um, and then the injury occurred. Um, sometimes it's poor coordination or cooperation between caregivers or, or with the care recipient. So you get, you know, that'll read something in the, the injury report, like the client tried to sit too early. And so depending on when you were trained, you may have heard, you know, some people use one, two, three, up to help somebody stand. Ready, steady, stand is much more popular now because it's much harder to have confusion about whether you're standing on three or stand. You know, it's ready, steady, stand. So coordination, cooperation can be another cause of these, you know, acute uh, incidents. 
And those are easily identified. The ones that are harder to identify is when you get cumulative injuries, the results of the buildup of small bits of damage over time. Each time, each little bit of damage isn't quite enough to feel or to hurt, but nonetheless, the problem's building up. And this is how the chronic musculoskeletal disorders, like the, the long-term back pain, for example, can develop. And these are much harder to identify. It's harder to determine whether it's work-related, although in you know, uh, nursing and home care, the high prevalence of, um, of cumulative injuries tells us that it is you know, work-related to some extent. Um, and so a lot of the suggestions that I'll offer today are about reducing risk factors, not just for the acute events, but also for the cumulative buildup over time. So most caregiving injuries are back injuries, the vast majority of them. Um, and most of them are due to overexertion. And so that's where, that's where the focus is going to be today. Before I completely move on, though, I just want to give a quick call out to the, the slips, trips, and falls category as well. This is, uh, depending on the season, really, the you know, second most common um, cause of injury. Data from one Ontario organization shows that this is normally, um, you know, it's, it's wet, icy, snowy surfaces. It's winter problems that tend to lead to a lot of the slip, strips, and falls. Not all of them, but an awful lot. And so if that's a concern for you, and if you'd like more resources on that, I'd like to point you to the um, TRI Home and Community uh, Team website uh, from Toronto Rehab. Uh, and they have a page on falls, which has a lot of very short presentations on falls prevention, including in uh, winter. And uh, the, especially the winter really does apply to um, caregivers uh, as well. I see a question, uh, overexertion equals acute or cumulative or both, can be both. Um, small amounts of overexertion routinely can lead to cumulative injury. One massive overexertion can lead to um, acute injury. The way that things are categorized in the, um, the injury data that I have here doesn't differentiate cleanly between them. So back to the, the focus on overexertion injuries, and as I said, mostly um, the back. So um, home care, occupational hazards. We know that homes are difficult environments in which to provide care. Um, in the client homes, there can be dangerous home environments, uh, like just flat out dangerous areas or you know, dangerous spaces. Sometimes danger is due to the space. Sometimes it's due to client choices. Um, you know, people choosing to smoke on oxygen, for example. Um, Homes are not set up as, as care environments. We know that. They're not designed as care environments. Um, and there's often poor access to equipment. You know, clients are responsible for providing their own equipment most of the time, and sometimes that can be difficult to arrange, difficult to afford. Um, the equipment might not be appropriate, any number of challenges. Interactions with clients and families can be one of the best parts of the job. They can also be one of the most difficult parts of the job, depending on how those relationships go. We also commonly hear about challenges with inadequate organizational support. Do people feel that they can rely on their supervisors um, to back them up if they have a problem? You know, if they say that this is not a safe environment for me, will their supervisor back them up or suggest that they go back into that environment? And I know that that's that can be a real challenge in some areas because you, know, you don't want to deprive people of care, but you also don't want workers to be at risk. Um, and then there are just the out and out demands of care work. There are, you know, we, we hear in the literature, people say, there are awkward postures, or physically demanding work, heavy clients, cramped spaces. And when I started my PhD, I tried to look for detail on a lot of that, and I really didn't find much detail on how the awkward postures came about, what exactly the physically demanding work was, what the exact consequences of cramped spaces were. And so the work over my PhD, which is really what I'm going to talk about today, focused on trying to, trying to get more detail on this, especially specific to bathrooms, um, so that I could try to you know, apply the engineering approach and look for solutions. 
So why bathrooms? Well, um, we see in some you know, published research articles that bathing and toileting are among the most demanding home care activities. That's pretty clear. We also see that injuries often happen in the bathroom, both to caregivers and to um, older adults. Some people have suggested, you know, this, uh, the new old age blog, you know, is the bathroom the most dangerous room in the house? It's in contention. Um, really what swayed me is focus groups with, um, with home care providers saying, you know, I think regardless of the diagnosis attached to the, the client's condition, it's really safe toileting, bathing, and showering. If you could solve those, it would really improve the risk level. And a PSW added, you know, that's the primary reason PSWs are going into houses, personal care. So a lot of that happens in the bathroom. And that, that's why I focused on uh, bathing and toileting. And from the number of attendees today, I assume that that's of great interest to you as well. So challenges in the bathroom. In general, there are small spaces to cope with. Equipment that can be useful in larger spaces often doesn't fit in a bathroom. This often leads to a reliance on manual handling techniques, which tend to place caregivers at greater risk. Another factor which came out very strongly when I talked to um, people who provide home care is the importance of normalcy for clients. Clients would like their bathing and toileting experiences, especially, to feel as normal as possible. They want it to be as much like their regular routine as possible. And caregivers try to, try to meet that need. And unfortunately, sometimes that's more dangerous for the caregiver. And that seems to be one of the places where extra risk can creep in. Um, something that came out very strongly as well is that when clients are unsteady and unpredictable, that makes, especially if you're relying on manual handling techniques with people who you might not otherwise um, assist manually, um, that really can add to risk. So when I look, when I asked um, the home care providers about activity specific challenges, the ones that they called out to me were assisting unsteady and unpredictable clients with transfers on and off the toilet, uh, providing perineal care, and raising and lowering the pants. Uh, with bathing, it was transfers in and out of the bath and shower, especially lifting the legs over the edge of the tub and assisting unsteady and unpredictable clients. So this, this was early work which helped to guide my focus. That's why I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. So first though, because as I said, there's not just one strategy that uh, fits everything. I'd like to review general strategies for avoiding back injury. And this will tell you again where I'm coming from on how to problem solve these things. First of all, every time before providing care, asking yourself, is this safe for me to do right now? And that's, how do I feel right now? Am I in pain? Have I had a recent injury? Is there something that could prevent me from doing this safely? How is the care recipient right now? We know that some people are, for example, fine when you go in to provide morning care. You know, they're reasonably steady, reasonably predictable, but by the evening, they're not quite themselves anymore, or they're not as strong. Also, people have good days and bad days, and sometimes you may need to adapt the way you provide care for that bad day, and it has to be okay to do that. Um, so how do I feel right now? How is the care recipient right now? Do we have enough time to do this safely? Everything takes longer once people get injured, right? Um, and is the uh, care environment safe? Uh, is there space to move? No trip hazards, floor dry, um, et cetera. Another thing is making sure that you plan ahead to have everything you need set up while the care recipient is still in a safe, stable place. When I did simulations of care that I'm going to talk about a bit later, one of the things I noticed is that especially when people were coming into an environment where they hadn't been before and seeing a new client, sometimes they would start an activity without having thought through the entire sequence of events first. Uh, and not taking that time to plan really had a cost in terms of the amount of time they spent trying to support a kind of unsteady client while also finding things. Um, or indeed in just looking for things, having to duck back and forth between an unsteady client and um, 
uh, and the equipment they needed. So that's just a reminder to plan ahead and that that does pay off. We have a comment from uh, Miles here saying uh, in workplace health and safety, we call this set of questions a point of care risk assessment. So yes, absolutely. Um, do remember to do that. And when you're working on how to do an activity, we're trying to avoid, especially trunk flexion. Uh, spending a lot of time in bending is one of the key risk factors for developing a cumulative back injury. There will be some bending. Some bending, a little bit of bending is not a problem. Severe bending um, for a long time, sustained severe bending is a problem. And so that's something where I try to talk about thinking about how you'll spend your bending, right? You've got a certain amount of bending you can do and still be okay. Um, try not to use it if you don't have to. Um, uh, lateral bending, generally better to avoid as well, and twisting your body, especially while you're lifting loads. All of these, um, the flexion, the lateral bending, and the twisting, they're one thing to do when you're not carrying a weight as soon as you add um, weights, even for example, lifting a leg, you're adding risk to that situation. And the more flexed your posture is, the more risk you're adding to that situation. So I'm sure you know that, but those are, those are my reminders. Um, and also body parts can be heavy, especially legs. Um, this is a little table. If you find the presentation afterwards, you'll see the information from the table. Um, but you know, remembering that a whole leg is 16% of somebody's body weight, and that can add up pretty quickly, and that's without swelling. Uh, other little reminders before we go, um, keeping a, a stable stance, you know, keeping your feet apart, one foot in front of the other, and keeping your knees slightly bent, and try to move in the same direction as the care recipient. Uh, I can't provide an easy demonstration of that now, but I'm sure that you can find um, YouTube videos, I've suggested one here, which provides a good example of, you know, uh, moving with somebody as you sit and stand, as you assist them to sit and stand. Another way of thinking about this can be, you know, thinking about keeping, keeping a load close to you uh, is important and within, you know, they call it a safety zone, if you look at like the green box. So those are just a couple of quick reminders before we proceed. And I know that all this is really easy to talk about um, when we're in, you know, empty classrooms, open environments, but it gets a lot harder in real life. Still worth remembering the principles because then we can work out how to make our trade-offs. So, bathrooms, our area of focus. Um, a lot of what I'm going to tell you I learned through high fidelity simulations of home care in which I had a, a surrogate client who portrayed a, a frail uh, older adult who was prone to hypotension. Um, and I had practicing community-based personal uh, support workers come in and show me how they would assist their client in usual practice. Um, I took videos, I analyzed their postures throughout the activity, and from this I found when they were in um, more severe postures. Uh, and when, as a result, the postural risks uh, were present during each of these activities, during each bathing and toileting. So for toileting, the sequence of activities basically help somebody to line up. You help to uh, remove their clothing, assist them to sit. Um, they have the opportunity to actually uh, eliminate. Then you provide hygienic care, assist them to stand, and dress them. So these are the, the phases of the activity that I looked at. And the ones that showed up as having the, the greatest risk really were, um, sorry, we've got, um, got undressing. If somebody was unsteady and you needed to provide a lot of help, sitting and standing can be a concern. And cleaning uh, really stood out. So, Basically, there are challenges in most of these activities. Ooh, and this slide doesn't show up that well at all. That's okay, it's not that important. Um, 
One of the areas where I saw the greatest difficulty was in providing hygienic care. Um, this can, if you provide hygienic care while somebody is standing, this can cause instability for the care recipient. It's also harder to do a good job in many cases. Um, in the case that you provide hygienic care while somebody is sitting, I was seeing a lot of sustained um, awkward postures from, from the caregivers. So people in highly flexed postures and bent postures like you see on the left um, for quite a long period of time. Hygienic care, even though this was a simulation, the client did not actually go, so there was no mess to clean up. Um, hygienic care took about a third of the time in, in, in severe bending. So people were severely flexed for a lot of toileting, and a third of this was because of providing hygienic care. The good news is this is avoidable. Um, using bidet seats, these are a technology that already exists that comparatively is not that expensive. Um, if you get an all-in-one, uh, that can be something like 300 or so dollars, which may be too much for many clients. There are, uh, there are also just add-on options, which are closer to 80 or $90. Um, that still may, by the way, my minimum level is must have heated water. If it can't heat the water, it's not appropriate for Canada. Um, so a bidet seat with heated water for 80 or 90 bucks could help to eliminate a lot of the care provider having to, um, to bend to provide hygienic care. Also, from an independent standpoint, it allows the client to perform that activity more independently without somebody else needing to be in there. And uh, I think a lot of people would prefer that if they could. Um, lowering and replacing the clothing were also issues that I saw. And I'm sorry for the image quality here. Maybe we can fix that before we uh, send out the slides. Um, if the waistbands are lowered before the knees or for lowering the clothing and when replacing the clothing, if waistbands started near the floor, the care provider needed to spend a lot more time in bending and was exposed to greater back forces. Um, this, this wasn't necessary in this case. I know that sometimes garments will fall to the floor anyway, and I know that some clients might um, want the garment to be lower below their knees so that they can spread their knees. Um, however, if as a default, you lower the clothing only as far as you need to, um, then that can be a good place to start and just a, a way to remove some of the unnecessary bending um, that can occur during this activity. So lower only as far as you need to. Another thing when you're actually assisting to, to pull the clothing up is planning the access route to minimize bending. So here the client was supported by a walker um, and some PSWs ended up bending over the walker or had an awkward time reaching through it. Um, you know, each cer the geography or geometry of each circumstance will be different, but try to plan your route so that you're not bending your, your trunk over as far. If you can, uh, bend your knees instead if you need to get lower. Sorry, again, all the images aren't necessarily showing up, and I apologize for that. Basically, for um, sitting and standing, um, we observed a number of techniques. Nope. Okay. We observed a number of techniques um, that were used to assist clients to sit and stand. Most of them were something like this image that we do have of the lady in the purple shirt in the bottom left, where people are leaning on a vanity and bending over and helping to sort of lever somebody up. Um, the preferred technique, in the absence of all spatial constraints for assisting somebody to, to stand, tends to be to stand beside them, position your hips you know, forward in the direction of movement, one foot back, one foot forward, and move with the client as you stand up. I'm sure that you've seen that in your training. Uh, if not, ask me about it and I'll send a resource video. 
Um, but that tends to be the preferred technique. There often isn't space to do that in home care. Um, so more space around the toilet would allow the preferred technique to be used, but you're not in your house and that might require a uh, renovation and so sometimes that won't be an option. If it is, go for it. If it's not though, um, there are alternative tools out there for sitting and standing. And so one of the things that we know we can do is to raise the height of the toilet seat, right? So we're probably all familiar with um, you know, raised toilet seats like this one with the green arrow pointed at it. Um, sometimes those can become a little unstable. It depends on the situation. Um, an alternative and something that is a bit more stable and also a bit more sightly sometimes is the, like it's marketed as bottoms up or toilevator, a toilet riser that can go underneath the toilet if clients are willing to consider that. So those can be ways to raise um, raise the client's uh, center of mass while they're toileting. Otherwise, ways to support um, sit to stand can be a transfer pole. Uh, I think these are quite practical, although I don't see them uh, used that frequently in bathrooms. I guess it depends on how, um, how secure your ceiling is. But the transfer pole can be used. Um, Armrests, either floating free or mounted at the toilet, can be used. Something I like about the ones that are mounted on a toilet is that you can actually uh, often remove one or flip one up if the caregiver is needing to provide more substantial assistance. It can allow the caregiver to get beside the client more easily. Otherwise, sometimes they get in the way. Uh, and sometimes a walker is used. And I know that um, if any were present at my my, the last community practice webinar I did, uh, my co-presenter Sheila Ritzy is not a huge fan of using uh, walkers for sit to stand because it can go wrong. The walker can move out of the way. Um, and some people prefer this, some people think it's riskier. I think it really depends on the circumstances and what your environment allows. Um, what I did see happening when uh, PSWs were using a walker to assist the client um, to sit stand using a walker uh, is uh, is that the PSW would tend to be having a hand on the walker as well as guiding the client in their sit to stand. When I when I did sort of a head to head comparison of these two options, the feedback that I got from PSWs was you know with the walker when she bends over she's holding there and she's down. Whereas with the armrests, I have to use one arm with the wiping and kind of block her like she's going to fall. So PSWs liked that the, the, the client could lean into a walker and not just be leaning into empty space during cleaning or indeed when they're standing up um, into, you know, they're standing up into a walker rather than standing up into empty space. Um, so... And then the PSWs also commented that the armrest did tend to prevent them from getting close to the client. And so there's a risk to the, to the PSW if the PSW is further from the client. They feel more secure and indeed they're lowering the potential loads on their back um, if you can get in close to the client. So there are some downsides to, to armrests as well, although it's nice that they are fixed. With transfer poles, there are a stable way to increase the, the client's base of support and reduce the horizontal momentum that they need to stand up. Um, there was a, a nice study by one of my colleagues at Toronto Rehab that demonstrated this reduction in horizontal momentum if the transfer pole was used. Um, and <clears throat> that's, uh, that study did find that Either having one pole directly in front of somebody, or if you're concerned that they may not be stable with that, having two poles, one on either side, um, was helpful, and that it was ideal for it to be installed at about 75% of the thumb tip reach. So that's a bit behind the wrist, as you see in the image here. And that installation allowed the pole to take more of the load during the sit to stand, um, reducing individual joint forces. So that made it easier on the client in addition to providing that stable item for people to move towards. So those are suggestions related to toileting. For bathing, 
uh, we can be looking at independent or assisted bathing. And I'd just like to make a brief comment on the, the independent bathing before we move on to assisted bathing, which will be my focus. Because we know that if we can assist a client to be more independent, the caregiver is doing less, it's safer for the caregiver. Right? Um, demands of standing tub entry, you're looking at having to step over a high obstacle onto a slippery surface. You can use to address the slippery surface problem, uh, common tools are a bath mat or a textured tub surface. Uh, both of these are, are great for reducing the slip risk. In terms of the challenge of stepping over the high obstacle, um, you can use a grab bar. Many clients will try to uh, rely on improvised handholds. Depends on the security of the improvised handhold, but uh, generally not as good an idea as the grab bar. And it's important to remember that grab bars aren't just there for the client. They're helping the caregivers too. They're helping the client to do more of the activity themselves so that the caregiver is not having to provide as much assistance. And by supporting the client's stability, they're reducing the risk of the client falling onto or falling and being stopped by um, the care provider. So grab bars aren't just for the clients. They're for caregiver safety too. Um, if possible, I know that the most common thing to recommend is a, shown on the left, it's a, a single vertical grab bar just at the edge of the tub. Uh, if your client is able to install a pair of grab bars, one slightly inside the tub, one slightly outside the tub, um, that seems to give more support for, uh, for the transfers because you're always moving towards something stable rather than sometimes anchoring yourself to a stable point that's behind you. Uh, as you're trying to lose the momentum from the transfer. So those were just brief comments on the relatively independent uh, standing tub entries. If we move to assisted tub entries, again, this chart doesn't show up excessively clearly, but the areas of greatest concern uh, in bathing were providing care to the lower limbs uh, and transferring in and out of the bathtub. So let's look at the transfers first, because this was also one of PSW's greatest concerns when I did the, those focus groups with home care providers. So getting in and out of the tub includes transferring the legs oh, and also um, assisting the client to shift across the bath bench. So I'm going to look at these two separately because they're quite different demands. So if we look at the lifting the legs, transferring the legs into and out of the bathtub, um, this was done basically the same way by everybody I saw doing it in my, my care simulations. There's a severely flexed posture that PSW is adopting to lift the foot up from ground level. The legs can be heavy, there can be swelling, stiff joints can lead to resistance. And there's the question of how much the care recipient can help. Um, hopefully you're reminding them to do as much as they can every time. Uh, but we know that sometimes care recipients will think, oh, somebody's here to help me. I don't need to do anything now. Um, so getting the caregiver to help or the care recipient to help as much as possible is good. There's also a high obstacle to lift the leg over. Um, so you're having, having to lift the leg quite a distance. So can we make it easier? Um, can we reduce the weight of the lift? Uh, remembering to lift only one leg at a time is good. And uh, whatever ways you can find for the care recipient to help lift their own leg are good. Sometimes that's as simple as a reminder. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, encouraging them to lean back a bit to reduce resistance uh, if, there, if the back bench has a backrest. Um, anything you can think of to get the care recipient to do more of the activity is good. Uh, can we reduce the height of the lift? Uh, if we could do that, it would be less destabilizing. It would be much easier on uh, stiff joints. So this is really up to the up to the care recipient, the homeowner. You know, are they able to get either one of the you know, step-in, step-out type tubs, or at the much cheaper end of the spectrum, to get a tub modified uh, with this little pass-through? Um, to make it easier to get legs in and out of a bathtub. 
And I know that not all care recipients or families will be willing to do that, but that is one relatively inexpensive option. And then finally, can we reduce the amount of um, bending needed for the activity? There are two options I compared for that, either sitting to lift the leg or using a leg lifter. Um, so I compared this stooping to using a leg lifter or sitting to lift the legs. And I'm afraid the demonstration pictures here are from a researcher, not a PSW, but uh, she did her best to simulate the techniques. So, whoops, the summary here is that um, I measured people's posture and the amount of muscle activity required while they were moving legs in and out of the tub uh, using this example. All right, graphics issues again will be corrected before this is sent out. But um, the summary is that forward bending was reduced by the leg lifter and reduced even more by sitting to lift the legs. So just sitting on a small um, stool to lift the legs. Although the leg lifter did take a little bit longer for people to use. Oh dear, again, we'll fix this. Um, arm elevation was decreased by the leg lifter, but increased by a sit to lift. So I said I would focus mo mostly on, okay. I said I would focus mostly on um, risk factors for back injury, but you may remember that the second most common kind of injury for um, caregivers really is shoulder injury. So I did also check, are we increasing risk to the shoulder when we're decreasing risk to the back? And in the case of sitting to lift the legs, it looks like sometimes uh, people's risk does, or um, arm elevation, which is one indicator of shoulder risk, does increase a little bit. And we see the same story when we look at muscle activity. The, the shoulder muscles are working harder when um, the PSW is sitting to lift the legs than they are when the PSW is um, using a leg lifter, or even than if somebody's stooping. So the summary across um, those slides is that you get less bending, uh, less back, back muscle activity, and it's easier on the shoulders if you use the leg lifter. That was also backed up when I asked the PSWs for qualitative feedback, you know, what's your perception of this? The leg lifter reduced bending and effort. Everybody preferred it. Um, sitting to lift reduced bending, but was not perceived as being uh, worth the hassle or the additional shoulder demands. Um, some people uh, refused or strongly disliked the, the sit to lift. Um, some also had something nice to say about it. So you know, sitting there was nice. And some people, some people, when they thought about a whole back and how much time they might spend um, washing feet and legs as well, thought that having a stool around would be handy for that as well, depending on how the back's organized. So pros and cons to sitting to lift, but uh, for some people, there may be benefit there too. The general summary is that le the leg lifter was um, better for the back, easier on the shoulder. Um, the device that I'm showing costs about oh, 45 or 50 bucks. Budget options that I have not evaluated formally but logically should work similarly um, include something like you know, a loop of towel, maybe some other loop of fabric. Um, I've heard people suggesting using a loop of TheraBend, you know, whatever you have handy, so that you are not having to bend the entire distance to lift the leg. Um, sitting to lift is much easier on the back, but harder on the shoulders and arms. And sitting is, is some work for the legs. So it depends on, um, depends on what's important to you in that scenario. Emily, I'm going to give you two minutes to wrap it up so we can open it up for all the questions that people are already typing in. Okay, I am getting very close. Great. Um, seated entry and exit um, can be done in an awkward posture. There's a question of bench positioning. You know, if you're able to put the bench somewhere where, where you have a direct line to assist a client to move. There's also a question of how much help you need to give. Again, when I was doing my observations, some PSWs prompted the client a lot about, you know, how to shimmy themselves across the bench. Others, by default, provided more assistance. So 
um, remembering to remind the client to do as much as they can by themselves is important uh, there as well. Um, and can we reduce the force needed? Part of it's how much can the client uh, do for themselves. The other part is that I compared using a similar process to the one I just showed you, um, a standard bench to a, sl a bench that can assist with slide and rotate. Cost, if you just want the sliding, is about 150 bucks with the rotation 200 or so. Um, or using a garbage bag on a back bench. The summary of this, I'm not going to show you the data because we're out of time. Uh, but the summary here is that sliding and rotating bench has some downsides. The catch locations are awkward. But there were substantial reductions in the force required to help somebody slide across the bench. And it was overall easier on the back. Um, even though people spent some time in awkward postures fiddling with catches. Um, the garbage bag is something that I, I tested because PSWs have told me they sometimes use that in practice. It's better than nothing on a dry bench, but actually using a wet bench comes, comes out just as well. So if, you're, if the client's not able to assist to move themselves across the bench, then if you're able to wet the bench before, um, before assisting the client to transfer, uh, it'll have as much benefit to sliding as a garbage bag without the risk of getting in the way of anything, like water running through the holes. Uh, washing the feet and the lower legs, I also looked at. I looked at a bunch of ways to get nearer the feet. Um, the stool, kneeling. And some of them looked like they helped, but the response I got from PSWs was, but, was, but of course a lot of their bathrooms are not really clean. So whether or not uh, PSWs were willing to consider sitting on a stool while they washed the legs, uh, kneeling while they washed the legs and feet, depended on whether they were paid to clean the bathroom before they did it. So it was a real, really good reminder that the context um, in which care is provided can have a big impact on whether some of these options work. Um, and with that, um, thank you. Stay safe, and I'll take any questions. OK. So Emily, can you hear me all right? I can. Right. So we um, had a couple of comments. One, concern that the stool promotes twisting. Uh, and and do, sure depending on how you sit. Yeah. Okay. Some people oriented the stool so that they were pointed quite directly um, at the care provider. Uh, the person in the picture you saw, unfortunately, researcher not PSW. Um, positioned the stool as close as possible to the bath, but did end up twisting a bit. Okay, thank you. And a question around the stoop. Um, the question is, do we lift one leg at a time or two with the leg assist tool? The leg assist tool, you would still only lift one leg at a time. Um, if I go back to that. Um, what you see here in the center is it's basically just a handle and a loop of plastic, a loop of rubber. Um, and so it allow you slip the loop under the person's foot, under their heel seems to work best. Um, and then you can use your free hand to guide, uh, guide the client's knee as you're moving the, the leg into the bathtub. So you just do that with one foot at once. You want to reduce the amount of load that you're lifting, even if you're in a less flex posture. Great. Um, another question was, or a comment was, uh, washing the feet first before giving a bath. Uh, if you can manage, if you can manage the water, then of course it's easier not to be bending over the side of the tub. Um, Managing the water uh, could be a concern. We tried doing that with a basin and having the client, or sorry, the PSW sit on a stool and wash the client's feet in a little basin before transferring um, into the into the bathtub. Um, I mean, it, it it's okay. Um, again, PSW's responses to it really varied based on how clean they thought the bathtub was and how well how close they were willing. Sorry, how clean they thought the bathroom was and how close they were willing to get to the floor. 
Um, but that, yeah, that can be one option for getting an obstacle out of the way. Can the patient use the leg lifter themselves? This leg lifter um, was selected for use by the caregiver. There are longer handled leg lifters. They tend to be about three feet in length in total, which are designed for independent use by the caregiver, yeah, or by the client, yeah. Okay. Have you come across any guidelines or protocol protocols on guiding patient falls? Um, as in, don't try to stop a patient who is falling, guide them safely to the ground? Yes, that's, that's what I'm interpreting this. Uh, yes, yeah, and so certainly the recommendation tends to be to protect the head and if possible, guide the patient down gently. Um, some people have shown me techniques that they use in terms of if they have, they can use sort of their thigh as a bit of a, a defense. So uh, one person showed me, you know, if a client's sitting down on a toilet and you're afraid they'll come down too hard, if you sort of have your thigh in their way, that can provide something safe for them to bump again against a bit and an easy way to guide somebody down. Um, Otherwise, in terms of the accidental falls that happen out elsewhere, the main advice that I've seen is protect the head as much as you can, but don't try to take all the patient's weight. Just guide them down to the ground, otherwise you will hurt yourself. I know that that is very difficult advice to follow in the heat of a moment, especially if it's a client you have a close relationship with and obviously you feel responsible for them. And I know that we still see uh, injuries reported where it is a care provider trying to prevent a fall or successfully preventing a fall and getting hurt themselves in the process. So it's and difficult, two, but it is what keeps people safer. Two interesting questions. Have we considered or are you aware if rope ladders on opposite wall are practical? That would help somebody to, to raise themselves up. Um, yes. That should work if you can anchor the rope ladder properly. I haven't seen anything on it formally, but that should work. Okay. And do you have any suggestions if the patient wants to face the shower head, how to reach feet? So that's a tough one. Yeah, you'll, you'll notice that I always had the back bench position um, basically beside the toilet, which would have their back to the shower head. And the reason for that was to give the care provider more space to move safely during the, during the bathing activity. But it does introduce its own challenges. And one of the things is that often people like to face the shower head. Um, in those cases, it depends on the configuration of the bathroom. So if that does mean that you're basically trying to wedge yourself in between the toilet and the side of the bathtub, uh, reaching the feet, yeah, is going to be more challenging. There may be options in terms of sitting on the toilet or sitting on the side of the bathtub, but I can't offer sort of formal recommendations. That's down to, to problem solving that situation and that geometry. Okay. Some of our PSWs use a, a pivot disc to toilet. Is this unsafe? Um, there are a there are a range of views on that. Um, I think it depends on the amount of control people have. I'm always wary of pivot discs because that means that the state a pivot disc basically makes it easy for the client to stand on it and makes it easy to move their weight around. As soon as you have that, the, your source of stability is the care provider. Your source of, your whole source of stability is the care provider because you're not getting stability from the client's feet anymore, if you know what I mean. So I think that if the, if the client is able to shuffle, that would be my preference. But, you know, it's, it's going to vary by circumstance. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of pivot discs, but... Um, other people feel free to weigh in if, if you have other views that I haven't represented. Uh, one of the earlier comments was around the tub modifier and if it's available in Canada. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely it is. There are people in numerous places in Canada 
who will modify bathtubs with those cutouts. Um, let me let me look look that out, and we'll see if we can add it to um, we'll see if we can add it to um, Bettina's uh, follow up email. Great. Oh, good. I see Eric agrees on the use of pivot disks. Great. Okay. Yes. Um, I noticed too in the in the picture with the leg lifter. I think. Um, it's, it's important to highlight that the caregiver has her knees bent and um, she seems to be adhering to some of the principles you've talked about in terms of her back positioning. Uh, trying to, yeah, and you see that she's less flexed than, when, flexed than when she's stooping to lift the legs. Often people were a little more flexed just while they were positioning the loop under somebody's foot. Uh, but then they tended to, especially the experienced PSWs, tended to straighten up a bit before they actually started the lift and took on the load of that person's leg. Okay. Um, and somebody did ask about where to get a bidet, and there was a response that Canadian Tire is a place. Amazon, Home Depot. Um, there are There are lots of places now, yeah. Um, what I wanted to test, I, I looked at a bunch at Home Depot. I, I see Canadian Tire's a place. I ended up ordering ordering online, and it was delivered. So certainly that can be feasible regardless of where people live. Were the use of commodes considered practical given the space constraints? Um, I've heard that a lot of people are quite resistant to using commodes if they don't absolutely, absolutely have to. It's kind of a last resort thing. And so with bearing in mind that importance of normalcy to clients, um, I was looking at you know where people are still basically, basically feasible to use toilets. Um, but it's it's starting to become a problem. So I, I avoided looking at the use of commodes in this case because um, because I think they're a less preferred strategy for clients. So so when I'm looking at focusing on uh, frail older adults, they're going to hold off on the commode as long as they possibly can. And I think it's when it's just starting to become a problem for them to use toilets is one of the areas where the risk is greatest. It's sort of that transitional period, or maybe it's the evenings when they're um, a little less vigorous, um, that I, I think more of the injuries can happen. Uh, a question around the devices again. Do you know if some of these devices you've recommended are eligible for funding with the assisted device program? Current ADP guidelines don't seem to include uh, bathing assist devices. Um, and I think that's a problem, because I think that the bathroom assist devices, things like the bath bench and the bidet seat, um, are very helpful for you know, that, the core mission of ADP being to you know, provide products to help people to maintain independence. I'm not quoting it directly there, but that's the gist of it. Um, and things like a bidet seat, things like a bath bench can be very helpful for um, helping people to maintain independence in what is one of the riskier areas. Um, that said, my understanding is that they're not currently covered. Uh, if, if anybody's interested in helping to advocate for coverage for these devices, let me know. It's something I'm trying to work on talking to more occupational therapists about, is ways to make it easier for clients to get these devices. Okay, Emily, we have one minute left. Is there a final comment you'd like to make? We have people who've been typing in saying thank you very much. It was an excellent webinar. They've learned a lot. Is there one final message or comment you'd like to leave people with? Well, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and talking about uh, bathroom safety. Um, I, I hope that you've learned something useful. And if if there are other realities that you think um, I should be aware of, or if you'd like to talk more about some of these options, um, I'm always open to that. I've got an email address on the final page of this uh, webinar. Where are we go? 
Um, and so, yeah, get in touch. I'm always happy to keep this conversation going. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you to all of our participants. We really value the fact that you have called and dialed in and interneted in to us today. And we look forward to more webinars with you. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.